many uh, people are interested in this concept, the concept of the abyss. And it is something that, uh, as a word, appears many times in the Bible, especially the New Testament. And what we'll do today is we'll try to touch on all the scriptures that we find in the New Testament in relation to the abyss. And then we'll look on some uh, extra biblical sources. And then we'll try to tie in all the uh, different uh, kinds of formation. So what comes to mind when you hear the word abyss? Me personally, I remember this late 1980s science fiction film with the title The Abyss, where a crew of American scientists are called upon to solve the uh, mystery of a crossed, a crossed nuclear submarine only to find little aliens at the bottom of the sea. So when people hear this word, maybe the mind goes back to this uh, Hollywood blockbuster from the late 1980s. Now, just to uh, clarify where this word comes from and what is its actual meaning, it's a composite word from the Greek a, which is without, and then bisos of bithos, which is bottom. So it's like a bottomless, uh, a bottomless pit. And we see this word surviving later on in the Latin language when the Bible was translated now in Latin. And we use that, uh, it survived as a concept. Uh, we see that in uh, Dante's Inferno and also in the translation of the Bible as an infernal pit. So that's the original take on this word uh, in uh, the Bible. Now let's just go through some of the scriptures and we'll try to ask questions from these scriptures in relation to the abyss. Now for the first time we see the word in the Gospel of Luke 8.31 where Jesus is rebuking the demons uh, he's obviously performing miracles and he's trying to uh, remove the demons out of the human beings. And he says, the verse says, And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. So two questions here. If Jesus is expelling them from human bodies, which is really a physical location, then the abyss must be a place too, with physical dimensions. And the second assumption here is that the demons are spirits. Therefore, the abyss must be a place for the spirits too. Now, another verse comes from the letter of uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, a uh, follower of Jesus, to the Romans, the congregation in Rome. And... This is a logical device Paul is using in order to preach to the congregation in Rome the value of faith. But for the time, for this, for this uh, particular moment, just forget the logical device Paul is using. Concentrate on the words about Jesus, where he has been and where he was, and then we'll draw some conclusions. And then it says in Romans 10, 6 and 7, but faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. So what we discover now from these verses is that Jesus visited the abyss. And if the statement of Jesus being in heaven is true, and it is because we know he's gone to heaven, then it follows that the statement that Jesus being in the abyss must be true also. So at some point in his life, Jesus did indeed visit that place of spirits. The question is when? And that brings us to another verse from another disciple of Christ the Apostle Peter, and he 
wrote two letters uh, that bear his name when he was in Babylon. And he's, he's got to say this about um, the abyss. He says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And that's the interesting bit here. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobeyed, disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. So, it looks like after Jesus' resurrection from the dead, he visited this imprisoned spirit. And you see this verb, visited, denotes traveling to some place. It would seem that in the place that Paul was talking about, and the one... Uh, and the one the demons were ter terrified to be sent to by Jesus. Now, now we, 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 because this is a prison for spirits, we also know from Peter that it is also the spirits that they were in prison during the days of Noah when God brought the flood. And so we're talking about the fallen angels. That's where God has imprisoned the spirits. Another reference to the abyss, it comes from the letter of Jude. A, his, uh, the brother of Jesus, and he wrote just one page in the Bible, right before the uh, book of Revelation. But many of the things that Jude said are very important. And there, in this one chapter, in verse 6, it says, And the angels, who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, this he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains, for judgment on the great day. So, this period, so we can draw some conclusions here. First, these spirits are angels, the fallen angels. Secondly, the abyss is a place of debasement. And it rates below the former glorious positions of authority that these spirits enjoyed before the fall. And thirdly, then imprisonment has an expiration date. These angels will be released for judgment on the great day. Now, one more reference comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 9, and verses 2 and 3. And then it says, when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke of a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. So as we've seen already, the abyss uh, prison to the fallen angels. But when the abyss is opened before the end of the world, locusts come out. So how can that be? Now remember, these angels have been imprisoned there for thousands of years. So in their fallen state, do not resemble any more angels of God, more like demonic locusts. And the second thought we can glean from these verses is that these locusts are associated here with scorpions, who, if you read your Bible, you will find out, usually you find scorpions symbolizing demonic possession. Now, having considered these parts of the Bible where we see the abyss referred to, and having considered the fact that it is a place of imprisonment for fallen angels, especially the angels that were removed from the earth during the days of the flood, I would like you to I would like to take you to um, a trip around the Sumerian text, and that sometimes is a problematic thing for Christians to do because. Usually, we accept only the word of God as inspired. But I want to draw your, attention to the, I draw your attention to the fact that Paul also was using Greek philosophers and poets 
as reference to uh, prove to the Athenians his arguments. And also, Jude was using the Book of Enoch and other references from his time. So we don't regard this extra biblical text as inspired, but we use it sometimes for reference and we can get a better picture of what's going on in the Bible just by, by reading um, um, texts of this kind. And the Sumerian texts are very important because um, the ancient Sumerian civilization is regarded by uh, the historians as the first civilization here on earth after the flood. And according to this text, it was ushered in by the Anunnaki, who introduced people in many things, such as music, the sciences, astronomy, languages, mathematics, and others. So we still use today some uh, mathematical time and calendar systems that have their origin back in the Sumerian civilization. And according to these uh, texts, each city in their civilization was guarded by its own god. Humans and gods lived amongst each other and the humans were servants to these gods. Now, interestingly, the Bible is not the only place where we find the abyss as a concept and as a word. Um, the abyss is also found in ancient Sumerian, Babylonian and Akkadian texts and also we find this word being referred to as Absu or Apsu, which is from um, the is a composite word from Ab, which is meaning water, and Zu, which means far or distant or deep. So basically, deep, far waters. So many experts have deciphered this as a place that originates with groundwater, uh, fresh water that maintains life, with the use of irrigation. But is this really the true meaning of the Abzu? And what you see here in this um, uh, depiction from one of these uh, cuneiform tablets is uh, God's Enki surrounded by the Abzu, which is these wavy lines. Well, as I said, one of the main, main deities of the Sumerian pantheon was Enki. And uh, the common translation of the name is Lord of the Earth, from the Sumeria N for Lord and Ki for Earth. Now, this God is also important for the story of the Abyss, since he was the one uh, that established the Abyss in the city of Eridu. Eridu was the city that Enki established here on Earth. And one of the, this is regarded to one of the oldest Sumerian cities. Now, Enki was the keeper of the uh, divine powers called Me, the gifts of civilization. And his image was a double helix snake or the caduceus. Enki was considered also the uh, god of life and replacement, and he was often depicted with two streams of water, as you can see from this picture, flowing from his shoulders, one representing the Tigris and the other the Euphrates River. And alongside him were trees that symbolized the female and the male aspect of nature, each holding the male and male aspects of the life essence, which he, as the apparent alchemist of the gods, would masterfully mix and use together to create new beings here on earth. And he's also portrayed in other inscriptions as coming out of the abyss as the one we saw earlier, or being inside the abyss. Now, Enki, as I said, ruled from Eridu, the city, the Sumerian city, and he built also a temple that he called e Abzu, which means the house of the Abzu, or the house of the abyss, and or the house of the subterranean waters. Now, his home was set in the depths of Abzu, and it looks like whenever a, a reference is made in these tablets about Enki or the Absu, they're so closely linked together that it's like referring at the same, both at the same at the same time. Now, the Absu is further described as a doorway from which Enki arrived on the earth 
and over which he built the temple of E. Apsu at Eridu. Uh, so there was some usage about this around. But to what end would he be using it? And uh, certainly not for fresh water, when the Euphrates was close at hand and abundantly fresh. So if this Abzu was also the doorway from his land to the earth, in what fashion would he be using it then? Uh, how did it function and just what exactly is his land? So these are reasonable questions that we have to ask when we see him building the Abzu in the city of Eridu. Now, there are further also texts which make things a, a bit more interesting and they sound like the abyss is more than just waters. Uh, first, we have uh, the Sumerian text, the hymn to Enlil, who was another god. And the text reads, the Abzu, which one can understand, which no one can understand. So if it is a plain water, how is this a mystery? Its interior is a distant sea which heaven edge cannot comprehend. So the question is, why is Abzu connected with heaven? And in the curse of Agadi, another text, we read Abzu, where the fates are determined. So these are interesting texts which make out that Abzu or Abyss is something more than just waters. And in the Sumerian text, you will find the Abzu always preceded by the article the. So which leads to the belief that the Abzu is, is not just a place, it's a state of being, of mind, not just a location. For example, you say, I'm going to London, or I'm going to New York, you mean you're going to this specific location. But when you say, I'm going to the city, you imply that you're going shopping or for entertainment to that place. So can we take that, the use of the Abzu with the at the beginning, to miss, mean something like this. Now, this is, in actual fact, a cylinder where Enki is pictured coming through the Abzu. Now, pay close attention. His two helpers on both sides, they hold something that looks like rods or pillars. And Enki is portrayed in smaller in perspective to them with stairs where he has to come down from could that possibly be the artist's interpretation of how to describe Enki coming from another dimension now as I said earlier the Sumerians had their own pantheon and uh, the three main uh, gods of the Sumerians were Anu, Enki and Enlil and you see, Sumerians had a very different concept. They, they all ruled different parts of the Sumerian world. And the Sumerians had a very different understanding about the world that we have today. And that would probably resonate more with people who believe in the flat earth uh, theory. The Sumerians envisioned this, the universe as a closed dome surrounded by a primordial saltwater sea. And underneath the terrestrial earth, which formed the base of the dome, existed another world and a freshwater ocean, the Absu. So here's how they saw their world. You have at the top Anu being the god of heaven or the firmament. And um, we as Christians will probably call him Yahweh. Then we have Enlil being the god of the air. And when I say air, I mean the immediate atmosphere with the clouds. And then Enki is the god of the abyss, the, the god of the fresh water, as you see from this depiction. So how does that all fit, all these concepts from the Sumerian mythology and text fits, fits with the Bible? Well, the Adediluvian world was very different from ours. And the Je book of Genesis uh, actually makes mention of that. Uh, Genesis being the first book of the Bible. And describes the world that exists before the flood in similar terms to the ones that the Sumerians did. So that world was very different. The climate was different. The continents were different. People lived longer. 
many up to a thousand years, many of the species of animals that roamed the earth were different and in many ways if we were to go back in time somehow we would have found ourselves in an almost alien world compared to ours. We read in the uh, book of Genesis chapter 2 and verses 5 and 6 and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew and that's the interesting bit for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground so a good what well, we can say that the the people up to the days of Noah it is quite possible they haven't witnessed yet rain now this is a big subject as I was saying we read in the uh, book of Genesis verses 2 5 and 6 and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground many articles have been written and many books about when exactly that happened many say it stopped before the creation of man but these verses don't make it absolutely 100 percent when it happened it is quite possible that, that situation carried on up to the days of noah now another thing that existed another uh, condition that existed upon the earth during those days we read in genesis 7 11 in the 600th year of noah's life in the second month the 17th day of the month the same day where all the fountains of the great deep and that great uh, deep is the hebrew tehom or tehom which is really the abyss and um, it says the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened so this great deep uh, represented the primordial sea that existed below the surface of the earth in noah's days and broke loose during the flood so this is the same primordial sea on deep water or deep waters that we find in the Sumerian text representing the Absu or Abyss and I think a great visual adaptation of what it looked like back in those days it was the uh, film Noah from 2014 and here is what where you see this uh, Abzu, this underwater uh, the great deep breaking up so you had the flood coming from the top, from the firmament, and from the surface of the earth at the same time. And that's why the world was deluged in such a small time. So that's from the Noah film 2014. So I think at this point, in order to expand our understanding of the abyss, we need to compare the texts, both Bibles and the Sumerian texts. And I think by putting side by side the two sources, you can gain um, a real good understanding of the abyss in the antediluvian world. So at this point, I'll spend some time comparing the story of the fallen angels on both accounts because. The fallen angel story and the abyss are all closely linked together and you can better understand what the abyss was like or the use of the abyss because of that account. Now the first account from the book of Genesis 6 and verses 1 and 2 we read and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose so when the scriptures say the sons of God we're talking about the angels that decided to um, come down to here to earth and choose wives from the humankind and God's purpose was to have humans uh, men and women reproducing and uh, the earth with offspring now this arrangement never meant to be um, for to, 
is there to accommodate the reproduction of um, species from uh, offspring from two different species, from angels and women. And that's why the, the hybrids that uh, were the product of that union, uh, they were the most violent hybrid, hybrid that the earth has ever witnessed. And that's why God uh, allowed only 120 years to pass before he brought a violent end to that world. And these hybrids are the um, renowned men, the men of old and the men of fame called the Nephilim. So that's the biblical account. And we read in uh, Genesis 6, 4 to 6, that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of all, men of renown. And that's interesting here. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So this is the uh, Genesis account as it appears to the Bible. And that account was handed down from God to uh, Moses. Of course, there were manuscripts, uh, old manuscripts that he had in possession, but the whole first uh, few books of the Bible were um, put together by inspiration given from God to Moses. And this is the story of this destructive hybrid uh, species as uh, found in the Bible. Now, we need to understand when you deal with the Bible and the Sumerian text, you deal with two different perspectives, two different inspirations. As I said earlier, one comes from God, from the God of the Bible in the book of Genesis, and he's retelling the story as it happened. And the other one comes from the Sumerian gods, handed down to the priests and the ones who were running the temples in Sumer. And these are two different sides at war with each other. And not surprisingly, the Sumerian records portray the Anunnaki in a more positive light. So Enki was not only the lord of the Apsu and the creator of the temple of Eabsu at Eridu, he was also the creator of the human race in the ancient Sumerian text. And of course, this is in direct contradiction with the biblical text where we read that Yahweh or Elohim was the creator of humanity. So how this contradiction occurred and what it means to us today is also part of this presentation. Also, let's investigate this Enki character more on this fallen story uh, here so we can ascertain also who the Anunnaki were and how they impact us. So, in addition to creating humans, the Sumerian text, and I use that word loosely, Enki also created, created apparently monsters and such a variation of animal-human hybrids in his temple of Eabsu at Eridu. So apparently he was playing the genetics and uh, of the various species of life here on, planet, uh, of life on this planet. Now, he also designed Superman, known in the biblical text as the Nephilim, we've just seen. And this Superman, apparently, uh, according to the Sumerian text, were men who were put in positions of authority and became rulers, leaders, and kings. And one of them was the famous Gilgamesh. And uh, we all know his story from the epic of Gilgamesh. And apparently, he was a thir two-thirds god and one-third uh, human. Now, now I'm going to concentrate in uh, different depictions of the abyss in the Sumerian text, and I'll let you draw your conclusions. I'll only try to briefly explain them, and then I'll let you make up your mind. But before I show you the uh, three different depictions, I want to say this. The first chapter of the Bible describes the creation of earth and all living things in it. So at the very beginning, the only thing that existed was the abyss, apparently. And we read in Genesis 1-2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Again, the same word, tehom, from 
Hebrew, which is of course the Abzu or Abyss. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So it would seem the Abyss was used as some sort of a medium for the creation of life. And this thought is seen again in the Sumerian texts. In the creation of man text, uh, the Sumerian texts speak of Enki taking clay to form man at the Abzu. In the case of Agadi, the text I referred to earlier, it reads, may you, your clay be returned to its Abzu. So I think this seems to indicate that life, creation of life or the extension of life is important in understanding the abyss. And here is some of these depictions in these cuneiform tablets. So what you have here is an Anunnaki, the third figure, uh, climbing a ziggurat at Eridu. And we also see Enki being surrounded by water. These wavy li lines you see is the Abzu, but he's right inside it. Notice also that on the far left and far right are his attendants that we saw earlier in another depiction with the water poles. And the second figure on the left seems to be a great god coming out of the Abzu as well at the top of a ziggurat. So the Abzu here seems lined with woven reeds, the same method used to build their boats and make the roofs watertight. And the reeds are needed to keep the Abzu water tied to support the pool of water. So that's one depiction. Another one is this one. In this tablet, Enki, uh, which is the second figure from the uh, right, is seen climbing a ziggurat at Eridu, followed behind by this uh, man with the two faces called Isimud. That was his minister. And at the top of the ziggurat, you see this Anunnaki with wings. He's coming out of the Absu, somebody else, also at the bottom, while water is being poured on top of him, as if exiting from a watery state. And notice again the ziggurat illustration is duplicated. So is this the location of the Absu? That is that the state of being? Or rather just a specific location mentioned in Sumerian texts? And the third one is this one, this tablet. Above we see the Anunnaki, the same Anunnaki as in the previous tablet, exiting the Abzu now, and he, you can see his full, whole body. And this raises a question. Is that a ceremonial practice? And what is its purpose? Because the Sumerians was talking about washing of the hands ceremony, which occurred at the site of the Abzu or in the Abzu. And um, here is the fourth one. Now, what you see here at the very top is the winged uh, disc, the, um, the vehicle of the gods. Then you see, if you see at the top, there's, oh, sorry, there's two vases, and then at the bottom, two others. And you see the water pouring from the top to the bottom. And that is the same as being in the Abzu. What you see also, this figure inside the Abzu, he, <coughs> he seems to, to be in an ecstatic state. And it looks like he's being rejuvenated from the use of the Abzu. And so do also the two winged fingers on its side. So both of these figures are gaining this renewal of life as the water passes over them. So in conclusion, it becomes apparent that the Abzu is something that is a lot more than a simple source of underground water. The Abzu was able to transform water to allow the great gods to extend their lives. Once in the Abzu, they totally immerse themselves in its water. And without the Abzu, the great gods would simply have grown old like the rest of mankind and eventually died. So they had to continually enter the Abzu and immerse themselves in this water in order to extend their lives. And this is the state of being I was talking about earlier that is referred to as entering the Abzu. Now, this state of rejuvenation, 
a state of rejuvenation, an accelerating moment where water itself can be controlled and one, one where one seems to levitate inside the Absu. And that's why when you read the ancient text, you find that important Adetiluvian cities were built on top of entrances to the abyss. So when you read the Sumerian text, you find that Eridu was built on top of the abyss. Actually, Enki was reported to have built this entrance. And also you find Babylon was built on top of the abyss. So what's interesting, when you compare this account with the biblical account, it's quite ironic that this power of rejuvenation of the gods was short-lived because what was once their place of rejuvenation, God decided to turn it into a prison by emptying the waters during the flood and in this way creating the flood of Noah. And apparently according to the Bible, as I was mentioning from Jude chapter 6, they are still there to this day and they have been there for thousands of years. But the abyss will be opened again, in, as we see in the book of Revelation. Now, the previous two verses from Revelation 9, 2 to 3, which I read, says, The fifth angel sounded, sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. And the star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. And when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace and the sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss so the abyss and its story are not uh, over yet the abode of the imprisoned angels will once again be opened at the end of times and but i think that's a part from another for another presentation and i hope with these 45 minutes i helped you see said shed some light on the Sumerian tablets and the Bible and uh, let you draw some conclusions on what it was and what was its use. Um, now, that brings me to the end of my presentation.